Hello, everyone. I did want to check the sound. Does this sound okay or is it too loud? I have two mics to try. It's fine. So it's fine. Great. So you're not going to be talking to the whole thing on the back this Nope. I'll just check on the sound. Okay. So, yeah. So we're setting up screen sharing, and I'm just letting you know I'm not going to be talking. <laughs> Matthew Larkham there. He was, yeah. Did you get a chance to spend time with him at all? Or? A little bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, can you see the. Yes. You know, while you're waiting here, you know, I, I uh, Mark, you're applying for that um, um, Woodhull summer course. You know? mm -hmm. So I looked at their website. And they have great speakers, yeah. and even the evening speakers are really great. So I, you know, I felt a little bad turning it down. It's like, oh, this is a really great group of people. It's an honor to be included in them. And I'm like, I, you know, I said I've blown them off two times now, two years in a row. And I feel a little bit bad about that. Yeah. Um, I just pointing it are out. Are we that streaming now? Or yeah, sure. Yeah, right. okay. uh, so, um, you know, I don't know if it was something we wanted to do. you ever think maybe Sumi Talk could do it or something like that. I mean, I just felt like it was hard, it's hard for me to justify a trip out there just for this. And, uh, you know, people should, people do do that stuff. They go out and just do a talk and they go back. And I felt a little bad about it. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I guess I'll give a short trip report on the conference that I was at last week. Um, so this was a... This is the Gordon Conference on Dendrites, Molecules, Structure, and Function. So it was a. Um, so these Gordon conferences are mostly invitation only. This was a little bit larger than I thought it would be. I was expecting something more like Banbury size, maybe yeah. a little bit bigger. This was about. So that would have put at like 50 people. This was more like 150 but, people. But unlike uh, that, those other conferences, they everyone presents, right? So this. So this one, they had a bunch of presenters, and then they had poster sessions. I see. So it was more like a regular it's like conference. like a mini conference. It's like a mini conference, but it was mm -hmm. pretty much uh, primarily invitation only. So everyone um, there either did one of those two things, they either do a poster or a Yeah, th uh, there were actually a few people who were, didn't, who were just attending. Mm -hmm. but, um, but anyway, Jackie Schiller had invited me uh, to present there. So I, was, I ended up doing the last talk of the whole conference <laughs> uh, to end it off, which was kind of weird. Um, anyway. Um, so this conference, as you can tell, is very low level. It's really uh, primarily, uh, well, it, th this really, I think, captures it. So it started off, the first day was- uh, is, that, is that those two titles the same, or is, it, or is the first title like a broader thing than they have multiple conferences and the second title is like a subset? Or is it, um, why are there two titles for this? I don't really know. This, maybe this is like the normal Title and this is like the theme for this particular year. I see. Because um, uh, okay. this is a recurring thing. Oh, I see. Thing. Yeah. It's a recurring. That makes sense. Then. Yeah. Um, but um, the first few days were really very, very low level um, on transcriptomics and uh, molecular stuff and genetic signaling and RNA and. Uh, uh, all sorts of stuff, which so I didn't really get a lot out of the first day. The first day I was kind of wondering <laughs> what I'm going to, whether it was a mistake to come here or not. But um, it's all really fascinating stuff, but it's just stuff that's beyond my ability to really comprehend it. Um, and then, but the second day onwards, it got, it sort of progressively got higher level. It started so I see some of the, one of these, like that 1215 one, is, is more, might be related to some. Uh, Health related issues. Yeah, there, there, there was a lot of that going on. I mean, why? Um, you know, what's the general a bit. What's the general motivation for studying the trans? You know, the, the genomes of these things and so on. Do they do they justify that or they? Yeah, it them? was it was um, a lot of it was around just understanding how synapses work and how signaling works with between presynaptic and postsynaptic sites mm -hmm. um, and plasticity. So they talked one of the. But they didn't. They didn't base that on 
diseases per se, yeah, not pure science. Yeah. Disease is, shows up um, as it does in a lot of these conferences, but it was not a main theme. Okay. Um, but they mentioned things like, uh, I don't know if it was this one or not, but there's, in the synapse apparently there's like 400 different molecules involved in the whole process of yeah. signaling and plasticity. Yeah. And it's a, a lot of it's triggered by calcium, but then there's like this whole chain of things yeah. and you know, someone studies three of them and then mm -hmm. someone else studies another four. And, yeah. um, it's really, really low level. Um, How many did you say? I think they said 400, mm -hmm. which is kind of I was, I was yeah. insane. <laughs> um, uh, so um, I, I, what I'll do is I'll just pick a, f a couple of different things that, that were interesting to me and I won't go into a, a lot of these talks but uh, there's a bunch of stuff on plasticity and homeostatic plasticity um, and so that was kind of that was pretty interesting so this is all about different so one, there's stuff uh, that about plasticity happening at different time scales, and then there's uh, homeostatic plasticity, which is how sort of resources are conserved um, within uh, a den within a, the neighborhood of a few synapses when plasticity occurs. And um, I thought that was interesting because it kind of connects to uh, a lot of what we, some of the rules that we have in our temporal memory. So this was one. Um, not this one. So here's an example of um, uh, one of the, the effects that they have. So they, you have synapse clustering, um, and let's say here's like a, a spine that's not active. So you're saying this, this is cluster synaptic potentiation, so I assume they're saying all of these things, all these clustered synapses get potentiated at the same time. So yeah, so a bunch of synapses get potentiated at the same time, but they look at this synapse, which was inactive. Okay. And this is unstimulated, and what happens is that this guy shrinks. Yeah. So this is a core thing in our temporal memory rule. Yeah. If if you have you know you increase the permanence of active synapses, but you decrease the permanence of inactive synapses, yeah. and um, and people are talking about these rules, which do exactly that. And uh, so here's a I think this was another one. Um, this is a more detailed one where you can see that here's a, a synapse that undergoes goes LTP or potentiation, and at the same time you see neighboring synapses, uh, they start going through LTD and the effect lasts for quite a while. So you're saying there's a group effect, but within that group, yeah, then things can go up or down. Exactly. Because this is this is obviously individual synapses going one way or the yeah. other. So, yeah. but this one was the. This one never got any activity. Yeah. The unstimulated. But I'm one. saying it's not. So it's a group. It's a local thing. It, you're still saying there's some uh, clustered effect that is. I'm not sure wh why that. Um, is. I don't know if the clustering is critical. It's it's the fact that this happens to be near a stimulated spine. Uh -huh. So the idea is there's some conservation of resources and proteins have to move from one to the other and. It's the same. Okay. okay. Um, um, and. So here you can see that the effect is large when it's close by the, the potentiated spine and then it decreases as you move further away. So it's really local to that, like a 10, 20 microns, 30 microns. So I'm sorry, I'm getting confused for that. You're saying... Oh, this, so this, is, this shows how r the relative amount of weakening that's going on in the unstimulated spine. Yeah. So You're saying it's, as it's, opposed more, to it's more if it's close to a spines that are getting yeah, activated. Acti activated. Yeah. Which is all consistent. Yes, with it's all consistent. consistent. You don't want to. You, you you just want to be changing that one group of uh, synapses as a whole. Right. And you don't want some synapse further away to to be affected by this. Yeah. 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 Which is, um, and one of the interesting things that we've found in the temporal memory is kind of the relative amounts of weakening and strengthening you have to do. Yeah. And um, I actually had sat next to the guy who presented this, Mirgan Kassur, who's at MIT. Yeah. Um, so what we he's the famous guy who did the the ferret the ferret. Ferret. I didn't realize that I yeah. realized that afterwards yeah. I was like oh my god this is the ferret guy <laughs> 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 um, but this so in our temporal memory what we found doing unreal data is that the the permanence decrement has to be lower than the permanence increment yeah right otherwise yeah. Um, and and that's due to the noise in the system yeah. And so I asked him, you know, 
does he think that's realistic? What is the relative effects? And mm -hmm. he said he thought about it and said, yeah, I think the depression would be lower than the potentiation, and he gave some reason for that. But he said, I don't really know why that should be. Mm -hmm. So I gave him our reason, which mm -hmm. is, he's like, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. So I think this is interesting that people don't really think about these from a, like a high level functioning, yeah. Yeah. functional role, but when I explain, oh yeah, it's because of, if you had a perfect system, you might not need depression at all. Well, this is why I asked my earlier question, because you know, it's always interesting to see what, what are people thinking about and what motivates them to do this, you know, and, and um, you know, when we met Wayne and he was like a guy who's just studying these effects and then he was saying like, oh, but you know, you guys are thinking about the broader picture and I was excited yeah. him, but most people don't seem to do that. Yeah. So I'm wondering, do they think about anything or, they, you know, are they just sitting there going, <laughs> I just, you know, I'm thinking, about, I'm thinking about these molecules and the genes and that's all I care about or, they, or do, how many of them are actually going beyond that to talk about, I mean, like, you obviously talked about that later in the conference. Yeah, yeah, so they would do, they might do, so the, the people studying plasticity at the level of spines, they don't really engage in, very rarely do they engage in behavioral yeah. things. It's really yeah. very, very local, a lot of it's in vitro, yeah. um, you know, they can just barely do some of this in vivo now, yeah. but here they're actually stimulating spines and seeing yeah. what happens with the other spines. And yeah. Well, this is in vivo, which is interesting, that was the title says. Yeah, that. yeah. Uh, so here, um, I don't remember what their method was, but somehow they were able to track these guys over a long period of time. Um, mm -hmm. and, I, yeah, and I don't know exactly how they know what was activated and what was inactivated. Mm -hmm. um, I think this one was in vitro. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, so one point I made in my talk is, when I talked about our learning rules, is that I put them all up, uh, maybe I'll show the slide. I was kind of happy with this slide. Okay. Here's this, well, I just learned this term at the conference, I threw it in. It's called heterogeneous plasticity. And Active and inactive I'm ones. But I'm not sure what you meant by that. So <laughs> I guess it meant that idea that there was differential yeah. potentiation in a cluster. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so these are the three basic rules in our temporal memory. So you actually added that to your slide before you presented. So yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's the advantage of being the last one. <laughs> nice. You got to speak your language. <laughs> So this is the, these are the three basic rules in our temporal memory, and um, what I did is I kind of translated that into their language. Oh, um, that's really nice. And what it so what this you know if there's a prediction reinforces the segment and if the cell is active. What that means is that if you have an NMDA spike plus a back action potential, then you have very specific plasticity of that branch, mm -hmm. and in particular, active synapses are increased, inactive synapses decreases, and so there was um, citations, and it was nice because three of these papers, the key people were at the conference, which is kind of nice. Um, and then if there's no prediction, we grow connections. Um, what this means is sub-threshold LTP, that is there's no NMDA spike, and you, need a, you want to encourage clustered synapses to grow. So this is like a sh cell fires, but there was no prediction before. Yeah. You want to start doing it. What was the references there? Were they, uh, so both of these people, two people were in the, one is Jackie Schiller's lab yeah. and the other is... Um, but what did they show in those papers? They show that if you have synapses that are active in a clustered way, then you encourage growth even without an NMDA spike. Oh, even without an Yeah, and a clustering um, is, is, is better mm -hmm. than not clustering. So in that case, you might have multiple clusters on different dendrite branches yeah. that would satisfy that criteria. Yeah, yeah. And so our model, we only pick one. Right. Um, but presumably those, those other ones, there are multiple ones that might be growing. But then how, when did they stop doing that? So let's say now one of these dendrite uh, branches uh, is learned, it generates a dendritic spike, yeah. gets your back action potential. We would want those other branches to, our model has those other branches stop working, you know, or stop um, learning. I, they don't have yeah, to. Yeah, but they don't could. have to. I, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong. You can have yeah. all, but you wouldn't want to be learning everything everywhere, right? Right. Um, but as you grow the clusters, the chances of it happening by chan uh, you know, randomly for something else, it gets lower and lower because of the SDR properties. 
Oh, so you're saying so just by natural they start to differentiate. Yeah. And I think it's totally fine to keep growing elsewhere. Well, I was wondering about that. Is I was wondering, you know, because maybe the one that you grew was actually incorrect. Yeah, yeah. For so, whatever reason. So our models always have it as a, we always pick a single dendritic branch. And yeah. That's the one we pick and we train. And it always it, it always struck me that's a bit odd because the 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 uh, the, the potential synapses that you that you want are you know how would I know where they are and, and so on and so it always it always wonder like well could it be actually in the neurons could you have multiple branches learning the multiple of the same thing mm -hmm. there's no harm in that I suppose right um, it just uses more resources um, yeah so and in our temporal memory we have kind of this idealized model that all the axons are near all the dendritic segments yeah we tried that, to the do, potential but segment. we didn't implement that we just yeah. did this greedy yeah way, so, yeah, yeah. I, you know, there might be some real different advantages to having multiple. Uh, it branches. would be because if statistics change and yeah. the segment you already learned is no longer really valid, but but the other stuff has been close enough, yeah. you could s learn the other one really yeah. quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't. We haven't really tested. You it. know, when I if you talk about like how, what's the capacity of a neuron, you say, okay, the neuron has say five thousand synapses, and let's say almost all of them are on the distal dendrite someplace. So how many different patterns you can recognize? Is well, if I allocate twenty synapses per pattern, then and I have five thousand. That's what two two hundred fifty patterns, and that you could recognize. But if if I'm representing those patterns, I have four different segments for each one. Then my capacity, in theory, would go down. Right. Um, yeah. So you're trading <coughs> off that um, numeric capacity with sort of a robustness uh, and, and whatever. I don't know if it would go down because. Well, if that, that segment really isn't doing anything, you could still relearn something. Well, I'm assuming that it. all the segments are learning. What's the maximum the cell can learn? Right. You know, 5,000 synapses, 20 per pattern that you're recognizing. If they were all perfectly orthogonal from each other, then that's 250 patterns. If if there's if multiple if those if I had multiple groups of cells representing the same pattern, then I in theory I would have I couldn't represent it, couldn't recognize as many patterns, right? Mm -hmm. So. I mean, it's not, a, it's not a big issue, although, you know, I'm always debating when I write about this or talk about it, though I say a neuron can recognize dozens of unique patterns on its distal dendrites or hundreds. Um, um, it just changes the, you know, the capacity of the network. And um, by the way, it just also goes back to the fact that no one really knows how many synapses are on these, these, syna on these cells. Right. Yeah. Um, just, I keep, I, keep looking for good solid numbers on that every once in a while and I can't find it. But people are regularly throwing around numbers like we do, like 10 to 30,000. Well, that's interesting because I, I, I've always, campus, historically in the cortex, the numbers have been more in sort of the three to ten, three to 5,000 range, but then lately people are starting saying 10,000, but I don't think know if they have any basis for that. And then in the, in the 30,000 number was the hippocampus, right. but maybe you see those in the cortex too. I remember once someone telling me that in V1 stellate cells in layer four, that there were 50,000 synapses on those cells. And then I went back later and asked some people about it, and they said, oh no, that's not true. So I don't know where that, you know, <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Um, it's, a, it's an important number. I mean, from a theory point of view, we could accommodate lots and lots of these. The system wouldn't break down if we had 30,000 or, or 50,000 yeah. synapses on a, on a cell. But no one seems to know. That's an interesting question. It also depends a lot on species, I think, because um, yeah. one of the speakers, uh, Mark Carnet from MIT, he was his he was basically showing examples of human uh, larified pyramidal cells and mice pyramidal cells and um, and rats, uh, and they were like, completely different in size and stuff. The human ones are much larger. Um, well, not, are we talking about larger in terms of number of synapses or just physically larger? Physically larger. Well, that's not that important. I mean, right? I mean, we know like the rat neocortex is only like a millimeter thick and human neocortex is two and a half millimeters thick, but the question is how many synapses are on those cells? Um, well, there's certainly a lot more dendritic length yeah. in there, so, yeah. uh, and they tend to branch more. Mm -hmm. um, and we also see a differentiation in different parts of the cortex. You know, if you go to some of the higher regions in the mammal human right. neocortex, you have much more perfusion. Yeah. It would be great if someone had done a study on this. I mean, one of the things that genomic studies might or should do is should tell us that stuff. Yeah. They, they, uh, they're starting to do a lot more of that. Uh, one of the big issues is, um, you know, how do you get healthy human neurons? <laughs> 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 Most of the uh, human neurons that they get are from uh, patients who have had epilepsy or have had a stroke, 
or so something they, so like they that. So they excise that tissue. To so excise, it's, yeah. So there's something wrong with that tissue. No, it's it's tissue that's on the way that, that they have to carve out to get to oh, the I stroke. Yeah. So in theory, it's somewhat healthy, yeah. but what he pointed out is a lot of these patients have actually been on neurological drugs for a while, oh. and that has an impact on yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, and so you have to be a little mm. careful. Mm. Um, so if, if anyone one wants to volunteer to, to have take a plug, neuron, <laughs> take a plug <laughs> out of <laughs> your brain, that <laughs> would really help neuroscience. <laughs> 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 Who do, you, who do I contact? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a. Anyway. It's like people. Who do. Oh, just ignore that. <laughs> it's like people who. Who <laughs> 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 Somebody followed the Twitch channel. Oh, did they so pay me? Did they pay us? It's like people who donate blood for money. You know, you can, yeah. you can donate blood. You, you take a core of your brain once a month for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but I was. Also, pretty excited to have a talk with the ferret guy. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was kind of cool. Um, another. Uh, Is he all aware of our work? Does he know who we were? Do you know? I think he was uh, vaguely familiar with yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. But he was not at your talk when we went to MIT. Uh, uh, so. um, this was another. Um, interesting talk by Randy Bruno, who was at our. Um, he was at Colts from Harvard. Colts from, yeah. Um, so this is um, basically a simple delayed reward task, and what they found in doing this task was um, um, in the apical dendrites, they they seem to become active in expectation of a reward. So. Um, so this is. What do you mean? Like I get a calcium spike in the yeah. expectation line? Yeah, uh, or calcium signal in the in the apical dendrites, and so, and so basically, if this is a. So that's like a, <coughs> associated with a dopamine type of thing, or is it? Uh, well, dopamine comes about later if your expectations yeah. met. Yeah, this is just an actual actual activity in uh -huh. the spike. So mm -hmm. here's an example of, like you get some stimulus, and then later on you get the reward, and mm -hmm. they delay the reward by three different, you know, zero mils seconds delay 250 500 and they show that this this bump in the apical tuft shifts along with when it thinks you're going to get the reward so that was kind of interesting is there a system level explanation for that like where is that coming from and you know what's driving um, i mean it's consistent by the way uh and this is in barrel cortex well, it's consistent with the, my timing theory with the matrix cells, which project to layer to layer one, and then you those would be on the apical dendrites. Right. Um, I'm not sure what cells these are, but um, uh, you know the idea that there's a timing signal, and that timing signal comes from you know, and it's going to be broadcast across layer one, and, and, and the apical dendrites would be the one that are detecting that time. Right. So that might be kind of a mechanism of how it yeah. does that expectation. Yeah. And and that would be on the apical dendrites. Yeah. Uh, no, did they you, didn't, they do you know what, level, what layer these cells are in here? Was that I think probably layer five. So okay, so those go all yeah, the way. Layer five. Yeah, the large layer five cells go all the way to layer one. Yeah. The, the, um, the dendrites. The act. I mean, the the uh, the dendrites. Um, it, this is also, but this is very f specific to the reward. So they might use the timing signal to ex to know when to expect it. Yeah. But this signal is also specific to getting the reward itself. Maybe you don't yeah. even anticipate it if you don't get the reward. You know, maybe who cares? You know, it's like if I if there's something going on in my environment, and I'm not getting a reward by it. You know, maybe I just don't even keep track of the time of it. It's just yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's specific to the reward, but it's not clear that you'd need to do the same thing without a reward in this case. Right. It, right. If it's um, if it's some temporary thing, it's not like the one the rat's learning a melody. It's more like a temporary thing. I assume the rat is is it's some temporary environment. It's it's. Um, I I think they learned this timing. Um, yeah, but is it? Uh, no, no, they don't learn it. This is the this is an. Um, it has to be learned to, to some extent. Like they have to have to have done it a few times. Right. To know what the anticipated timing is. Right. Yeah, I'd have to read it in more detail. Yeah. I don't remember exactly the protocol. Um, but it's also um, part of what you need to do reinforcement learning is, is yes. to know the the, the reward. Um, 
Can, you explain, can you explain that? Well, how does the reinforcement in the learning require the, the timing of it? Is it, um, uh, I think it's obvious to me, but I just, um, uh, you, have to, you have to do the reinforcement. At, uh, yeah, you want to do the, the learning as close to the reward as possible. Right, that's one thing. Um, but knowing that you're going to even get a reward is, is really important in the reinforcement learning. Yeah, but, and, but, but and that and doesn't require the timing. No, because uh, what the, what's important is the prediction of the reward. Um, and so if your prediction is off, which would include the timing, yeah. then, then you would adjust. Because uh, you, you want to, this, yeah. this is probably too simplistic, but if, you, if your reward is dependent on timing, then you would want to learn that timing. Yeah. There was a bunch of talks. <laughs> I could see, you know, Matthew Larkham's kind of frustration here. There was a bunch of talks that were trying to find NMDA spikes or local dendritic spikes in vivo, and did not find them. Mm. Um, and these were all calcium imaging studies of dendrites. Mm -hmm. And so a bunch of people were saying, "Well, no, th th that's just an in vitro phenomenon, and in vivo you don't get." These are NMDA spikes NMDA or calcium, sp calcium spikes. Um, and NDA spikes. Uh -huh. So everyone finds calcium spikes, which uh -huh. are big global events. Yeah. But local dendritic spikes, the, 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 a bunch of people had trouble finding them. <laughs> so, mm. uh, and then the next day, there are a couple of people who said, no, we do see them. Um, and I spoke with uh, Jackie Schiller and Matthew Larkham and stuff about this. And they said that cal this is like a constant thing for them. For years, people have been saying this. This debate, um, mm -hmm. uh, and basically whether they exist at all, whether they exist at all. So I just was writing about this yesterday in, in the book, and and I phrased it differently. I said there's a debate whether they do anything, but it's really more of a debate whether they exist. Yeah, in in vivo. In vivo, well, yeah. obviously that's in vitro. Matter. They're like, oh yeah, you can do whatever. You control yeah. all the membrane potential. Yeah, you, you can do whatever you want, but does it actually happen in vivo? Uh -huh. And then basically their take, Matthew Matthew and Jackie's take is that these techniques would not pick them up anyway because they're calcium signaling, they're slow time constants, they're, you need to pick up something within 30 microns, which, um, and there's so many of these global events going on with the calcium spikes mm -hmm. and back action potential that those signals are going to be washed out. You, and you need to find tasks where it's really important to, do, to have an MDA spikes. Mm -hmm. so these are like very basic, yeah. no, not this paper, but um, the studies or they were fairly basic, so. Yeah. Well, you know, this, uh, this whole dichotomy between, like we talked about how the cortex models the world and the structure of the world and the time is melody and so on, but almost all these animal studies are doing very sort of temporal uh, uh, behavioral tests. Right. They're not really testing whether the animal knows something about the world. It's just like, hey, can I remember right now that turn left or wait yeah. half yeah. a second? Yeah. And, um, uh, and that's natural because it's really difficult. You can't ask a rat, like, uh, what are you thinking right now, you know? Right. <laughs> but but, um, but it's interesting. Yeah. How did that debate play out? I mean, did... did oh, I asked lots of people about it afterwards, and like some people are like, oh, there are no local dendritic spikes in vivo. I've looked for it. I've tried really hard. I can't find them, blah, blah, blah. And then the others are like, no, it's the techniques are flawed, and they're there. Did, anyone, seen them did, 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 <laughs> did anyone make a more cogent argument than anyone? I mean, were they debating this, or you were just asking them? Was that a debate, public debate in this conference, or was it? It was, it was a polite public debate, yeah. because people would say, no, they're not there, and then someone else would say they are there. Mm. Uh, so it depends on the techniques. Mm. But I think, in general, we have to be very careful about calcium imaging, I think, with our level of stuff, because the timing stuff, it, it's, A, it's very noisy signal, um, it's not a very reliable signal, and two, the timing issues are really quite... Because uh, it's too uh, slow. It's, it's too slow, it's a yeah. 70 to 100 millisecond kind of time constant. So anything that yeah. depends on, you know, coactive synapses within 5 milliseconds, yeah. you know, 30 micron activity is going to be yeah. very hard to figure. Yeah. Um, uh, the big technique that everyone is waiting for is these voltage-gated dyes, which... Um, they've been around for a long time, haven't they? They've been around, um, they're starting to get better, and uh, people are starting to think you can do that in vivo, mm. uh, and this would have millisecond-level timing, and I think it will just completely remove, take calcium imaging out of the map mm. once they, they have that, so that'll be really nice when they have that. 
Um, there was a couple of people who spoke about place cells learning with calcium spikes. I think we've read one of the papers here from McGee's lab. But the basic idea is you, you it basically in one shot, a calcium spike can cause a cell to learn to become responsive to a particular place. Because hmm. in one shot learning. Um, so the calcium spike is a very strong driver of plasticity. And um, what they notice is in the cell, in a normal condition, it, if, if you know, you're getting sensory input, there's a membrane potential ramp up as you get close to the cell where it will get a spike, yeah. and then it gets a spike and it recognizes, from that point on, it's a place cell for that location. Um, and this ramp up. So you're saying that, what's, yeah, where's the ramp up coming from? Yeah, so the ramp up is coming from, they think from sensory cues. Like the cell is. So the, okay. the cell naturally has some sort of, um, it, it's naturally a place cell. And it's, it's it, graded, it, but it's a sensory input, it's a natural place cell encoding. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't yet respond to a particular place, but but it's ramp it would it's be ramping up in a in, in it's a way ramping up and then uh, and then there's a calcium spike oh yeah. and then from that point on it starts responding to this uh, to this place. But it's it's it started responding and it starts spiking. Yeah, but it's sort of in some sense it's a place cell before them because if it's ramping up as it approaches, there must be something inherently about the circuitry that says, "Hey, I'm gonna I, I know this place. I'm getting closer to it." Yeah, so they, they, they they want, the distinction would be like, oh, I want to remember it now versus right, right. it's natural that it occurs. But, but it may be that there are lots of cells which are ramping up and only yeah. one becomes a place cell. Oh. Um, so that could happen. Oh, interesting. That's um, true. Yeah. And then they showed that this ramp up was dependent on the running speed, which is what you would expect yeah. if it's sensory driven. So that, that was kind of, so that was mm -hmm. nice. But then the same person also said there's no local that you would expect. So. Um, there's a bunch of stuff on neuromodulators, which I found kind of interesting. I don't know too much about them, but I need to learn more. But there's stuff on serotonin. Yeah. And apparently this is um, uh, critical for what they call cognitive flexibility, which is kind of what we might call continuous learning, like unlearning something and relearning something else. Like if you've learned something and now you have to, s now a signal means you have to respond to something else than what you had to before, then serotonin is important for kind of discarding those spines and learning new spines. Hmm. So um, forget. Hmm? Help you forget. It helps you forget uh, or, or learn new things. Forget. In a particular context, we learn a new thing. So some neuromodulators, most of them are actually sort of broadly, diffusely to spread, but some are not. Do you know? Yeah, serotonin? so serotonin is distributed throughout the cortex. So at, at the same time. Right. That I don't. Oh, that's that a, that like there are many of these neuromodulators. There's sort of cells that, that that send axons to release them. Yeah. And those <coughs> axons spread very broadly. So like everybody's being told at the same time, you know, some emotional state or some learning. State. Um, what I think what my understanding is for things like dopamine, it does, the axons go all over, but the release can be very local. So oh. a, a particular part of the cortex can say. Uh, you maybe recognize some pattern and then dopamine will be released oh, that's locally. Interesting. Um, something like that. I'm not, that's again, I'm not... That's new. I didn't know that. The early studies I read about uh, neuromodulators, and this is these were probably a couple decades ago, they, um, they didn't describe that. They basically described that the neuromodulators were released globally because the axon spread globally right. and there was, no, there was no sense that there was a local release. I kind of somehow remember the serotonin might have been always associated with a local release, but that's why I was asking because I couldn't really remember. Um, but anyway, it could be that they all sort of have some sort of, they, the signal's available everywhere. Everybody has the same basic signal to say something, right. this thing is happening, but locally they could act differently on it. Yeah, I yeah. think so. I'm not, don't quote me on it. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, the other thing is serotonin is very related to that. Serotonin is related with detecting novel stuff, yeah. which is kind of yeah. almost the same thing. but. It kind of reminds me of our columns paper where we kind of assume there was some external signal that says, oh, you're learning yeah, a new yeah, object. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of like that. I think I, I kind of knew that before. You remember, I said it's like a yeah. switch. We just turn it on, turn it off. I think yeah. I knew. I, well, if, I, if you'd asked me, I would have guessed serotonin, but I don't remember. There's a bunch of other ones, too, which I don't really. So. I think that gives it our learning rules a lot more flexibility. and um, It's kind of interesting to think about. In machine yeah. learning, the, the people don't model this at all. 
other than just general reinforcement learning. Um, but I think there's sort of all, all this kind of more local ways of, of tuning plasticity and maybe one side of the brain can tell another yeah. side of the brain mm -hmm. to learn something and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So it's kind of, it's just very intriguing, I think. I wonder that could maybe be a possible solution to our disjoint pooling learning problem. Remember where you want to yeah. learn in some part of the cortex that's not getting the input right now or something like that. Yeah. And it's thought. Anyway, that's kind of gives you a flavor for the conference. Hopefully, pretty small scale, local stuff, but uh, it, was, it was quite interesting. And then, how did people react to your talk? Was it first of all, were there any other people doing system level stuff, presented system level stuff like you? Mm, not really. <laughs> if I, I think there might be one. There might have been one other person uh, who did it. But I, I, can't, I don't remember right now. Oh no, there was one other person who um, had this dendritic learning rule and then used that to do s auditory source separation. Mm -hmm. So look at a task where there's audio coming from two different people and be able to separate it out based on mm -hmm. correlations. Mm -hmm. So that was the only. Um, so uh, Dr. Fukai from Japan. Mm -hmm. So he's, that's the only other one I remember. Well, it's nice they invited you, although you do seem like a bit of an outlier on this. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I guess, yeah. Although, I mean, our stuff really uses the output of yeah, this I understand meaning. that, whether yeah. they care about it or not, yeah. so I have a question. I, I, I think they do. I think they, they, they want, you know, and I mentioned that we're like one of the, although a lot of people are seeing how machine learning can help neuroscience, yeah. we're like one of the few labs to that's trying to study how neuroscience can help machine learning. Um, and people are really interested in that direction. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. okay. yeah, and I think people like my talk. Mm, that's good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Is it me? Does anyone else have anything to talk about? No? I, I, I want to just talk about this. Uh, I'm going to try to make it concrete. Um, this one thing that we can do, and I don't know how we do it, and um, and I think it's a um, it's a good way of sort of resolving the issue. I've been talking a lot about these sort of radial and linear metric spaces, and and, we've, and these relate to the issues we've talked to Marcus in the past about you know eyes being at some distance from an object and solving all these sort of problems of uh, triangulation and so on. So I'm just going to talk about this one problem. I, I'm just going to try to articulate it clearly. Because I've talked about it before, but I don't think I've ever articulated it as clearly as I think I can articulate it now. So um, it relates to sitting in this room. And I'm just going to erase this. And the idea is you have, you're in some room. And this is, of course, a metaphor for an object, too. So just talk about, like, you know, place cells and grid cells. But it's the same basic problems occur with neocortical stuff. Um, and I, I go in this room and I, and I sit down someplace and, um, and I see there's some, there's some things in this room. And uh, just without moving around the room, I, I can observe this room. And then uh, later I come into the room, the same room, excuse me, I'm trying to recreate this. And I'm at a different location. And, uh, and I don't move again. So you know, you pop me in the room, take my blindfold off, I look around, pop me in the room, a day or two later, in a different location, I look around. And I, A, know both that it's the same room, and I actually know my location in the room here. I know my, it's as if, almost as if I went from here to here, but I know this. But I've never moved and I've never built around, walked around this room. I've talked about uh, before that, you know, you could, you could imagine yourself looking at different objects at different positions, at different orientations. 
and that you could learn to represent this position by objects at different, uh, different radial uh, metric locations relative to you. That this is a way of learning this point in the same way we learn objects in the XYZ coordinate sort of frame. This is a way of learning this point by, there's a path integration component of this. I can, if I come over here, I come back, I'm at the same point again. Um, and that I could learn that these are objects at different points in this radial space. And so I can, uh, and the idea that I could learn a place code for this, and that place code would be stable over changes in orientation. So I've talked about that. Um, so that's like, that's how you might learn to place cells. You could just look around and observe things in different positions, see whether it's in three dimension or not, and you know that point. Um, so I've, that's part of this problem, it seems, but it didn't explain how it is that I can now come into the room at a different point, and I don't, I, I, of course I'm in a different position, and I would have a different sort of object, radial object around me now, but, but I know I'm in the same room, and I actually know my location in the room. So somehow, and what tells me, what this tells me is that, um, I'm able to learn the complete structure of this room, including the, the two-dimensional grid cell structure uh, of this room, by just sitting in one spot and radially observing it. And so I don't actually need to move around the room in this case. Um, I can just, I can learn the structure of the room. We've always talked about, oh, I have to learn the, with my finger, I have to move my finger over the object to learn it. Well, this is true because I can't observe the object with my finger from a distance. But with vision, I can. We've talked about the stick problem. You know, you can learn things with a stick holding your hand up. So we've already, we've already had this notion that, hey, if you just think about the finger, I have to move around. If, this, if I was thinking about fingers and coffee cups, I'd have to be moving around this object to, to observe all these features. But with vision, the vision, I don't need to do that. I can just sit here, and, and just sitting here, I can build the complete model of this room, the, you know, the two-dimensional grid cell model of this room. And I, I might, and I conclude that because when I come into the room from a different position, uh, I invoke the same model of the room. I actually know my location in the room, so the reference frame that I used here is the same as the reference frame I used here. And I'm not talking about the radial reference frame. I'm talking about the uh, the grid cell um, linear reference frame. So this is a puzzling uh, thing, um, and and it what it just but it, it it brings up this very interesting question how it is that I can learn, uh, I can go from this position to learning what we think of as the grid cell model of, a, of an object or a grid cell model of a, of a space. Um, that, um, you know, we, we struggled in the past saying, oh, my eyes are at some point relative to the coffee cup, but, but we always thought that in terms of X, Y, you know, X and Y grid cell type of stuff. Here I'm saying, no, I can just, I can just learn the structure of something by just radially observing it and then that learns the grid cell x, y, and z, or the x, y model of the world. So somehow this has to occur. Marcus, I don't know if, if you've thought about this or not. Yeah. Um, but it's related to things we've talked about in the past. I figure you probably have thought about it. Um, and, it's, and I want to hear your observations in a moment. But it's almost like, like we have to go between this sort of body-centric framework, like this is at this distance from my body, and this is at this distance from my body, and this is at this distance from my body, and this is at this distance in orientation from my body. And go to that being that this is at this location relative to the room, and that's at this location relative to the room, and at this location relative to the room. And you have to do the orientations too, because I have to observe the orientation of the object relative to my body, then I have to translate that to the orientation of the object relative to the room. You gotta go back and forth between all these things. Um, in a very simple way. So what have I missed? <laughs> well, so like I can always keep coming back to um, to the version of it that does most of what you just said. Uh, that, that has the that's going to have a limitation around orientation that I can talk about. Okay. Uh, well, I, yeah, fine. Yeah. Uh, of course, I do want to get around that limitation. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, um, this, like, it's so satisfactory. this is gonna, this this work this is compatible with half of the orientation thing, but not the other half. I'll I'll show you what I mean. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, so the way I've approached this in the past is that you have this, uh, here A, B, C, and D are like child objects, and yes. uh, and when you when you when you're right here, you see you look. We'll just go in order. You see A, 
um, what you want to represent is like you, you have a um, the, the, here. I'll just use like dotted lines to signify that this is like a, like a map, um, not not an actual room. Um, you have like a, a a map of A, um, and here I'll I'll draw it up to the right. You have a map of A, and what you want to represent is like I'm right here, uh, and on my map of A, here's where I am. Yeah. Um, and then either uh, either simultaneously or at I mean, by the way, that's your location in this location space of A. Yeah. It, it intuitively, it doesn't feel that way. It, I feel like it flip it around. I feel like A is is position relative to me. Sure. Feels that, like, they're just two different ways of saying the same thing. Well, well the diff difference one, if I think about where something is relative to me, I think about where columns. If I think about where I am relative to something else, I think about what columns. Mm -hmm. So if the answer to this relies on what and where pathways simultaneously, it's a difference that could make a difference. I mean, the solution may require two separate columns op operating together, where the other way it might not. So it's, it, it's a, it's, it might be an important distinction, yep. but let's keep going. Yeah, and, and I mean, to, just so for clarity, this is like this is essentially represented by like some set of grid cell modules yeah. for, for uh, probably, and some sort of orientation. Uh, so you're not just representing this dot; you're also representing like what what direction you're facing right now. Uh, oh, you're saying the orientation. Of, uh, well, that's also the equivalent. Again, that you can flip that around and say, um, what's this orientation to me? Yeah. <laughs> if I think of it as a where column again, it's like oh, here's here's where. Two ways to look at this. This is where I am relative to the object yep. in my orientation and so on, or it is where the object is relative to me in its orientation. Yes, okay. and and yeah, yeah, and those are um, those are two ways you could approach this that would. Um, my suspicion, by the way, that the way I keep wanting to do is going to be the one that's going to work. I have a, okay. I have a suspicion that it's going to be a where column, but let's keep going. Okay. I want to just keep interjecting that there's these duality of the way we're thinking about it. Yep. Yeah, because you, you can always just change your terminology to say that, like, uh, here, where am I in the space of the object yeah. versus where is the object in the space of me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's really just a language thing. But in, in neural tissue, it might be a big difference, yeah. that's my point. Yeah, exactly. Like, these could be, these, yeah. yeah. We where cells and what cells versus, you know, all trying to do it in one column type of thing. Yeah. So, um, so where I'm going with this is uh, either in different cell populations or, either, or simultaneously, you want to... Um, Say okay, now here's where I am in my and my location space of C. Yeah. Uh, and um, and at this point, you 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 will have turned. So you here yeah. suppose you turn from A to C. Uh, that that will also turn this. That this will also turn, and you'll be looking that way. Yeah. Um, and are you are you going to say I'm going to keep this reputation going, or do I have I lost that? Um, you uh, you. Different options. You could keep it going, uh, but where I'm going to go with this is like the original compositional object space. Yeah. Uh, if you have like, uh, okay, this might be one of your, this might be your child object space. Uh, uh, this is your parent object space, uh, and oops, that's supposed to be Ramis. Um, and you want to take the displacement between um, right, these so and it, store it somewhere. Uh, okay, so it could be a transitionary displacement. Well, like we've talked about many times, like. I could have the displacement this way to A, yeah. and I switch it to this way to B, and that, and if we do the displacement on the moment-to-moment -moment transition, I got what I need. So that would mean I wouldn't have to keep this around. Yeah. I, I could just uh, okay as I transition. I really like that idea, by the way. It's the uh, which you and, uh, and uh, Scott, Scott proposed is that this you know you could every transition is a is a displacement moment. Yep. Um, and so I you know there's a real sense of what I'm doing when I'm sitting in the room. I look. And then I look, and that transition is what builds up this representation. So, and it's easier not to keep all these things around simultaneously. Yep. So, so as we go through time, if I look at this as a time um, uh, thing, then I can say, oh, as I do this, I have a displacement moment right here, and then I don't have to keep this around. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's keep going. So now I, I basically have a dis you're arguing I'm going to have a displacement between what um, um, between where I, where I am to this object and where I am now to another object. Yeah. Um, yeah. And by storing a set of those displacements, uh, that, well, the, the important fact here is, with a little bit I've said there, um, the displacement is going to be the same whether you saw those things from here or from here. Uh, oh. 
Yeah, because there, it's, um, you know, it's hard for me to think of it that way. It's easier for me to think about it when, like, again, going back, flipping it the other way around. I, I, I know you've got it in your head one way, and I, I just have trouble thinking of it that way. If I think about it, um, even though they're equivalent, if I think about it more like, okay, uh, where, are, where is this relative to me and where is this relative to me, then I can easily imagine building up, um, boy, it's just hard for me to get my, it's like all the words make sense, but it, haven't, it hasn't crystallized in my head yet. You're saying by doing this, by learning like, okay, I'm going to learn the displacements, the displacements between these two objects and displacements in these two objects, I can learn the displacement between these two objects. Yeah. So is, is that what you're, that's what you're saying, right? Yeah. But it's, it's not, what's the actual step to do that? Um, I've got, you know, this displacement is between here and here and then here and here. Um, and you're saying it doesn't matter. I'm going to end up, this displacement is going to be the same. It doesn't matter where I am that made this observation. Right. I don't, I like that, but I don't see the mechanism for it. Um, what is the mechanism that would make that displacement the same? Is it just naturally come out of the displacement cells? Is that it naturally comes out of them if, um, it, you know how these, Location spaces; these maps sort of have a natural compass rose to them. Yeah. That that like where this head direction cell corresponds to maybe up in this space. Yeah. yeah. They need to all. They all have to be consistent across yeah. this time. Yeah. So yeah. that's so, that's clear. Like place cells in the in the hippocampus are orientation specific, and um, and so even if I did like a radial map like I talked about here, it would be it would be very specific to this environment. Like the, the, I would have different place cells if the same sort of objects were rotated. So there's a continuity of the uh, orientation across. Well, I think that's what you're saying. Yeah. 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 And and that is a very real constraint. Like that's a, that's um, the yeah. idea that like if you went into another room and C was like rotated. That'd be different. It'd be, C would be like a different child object at that yeah, point. Yeah, it would, exactly. it would be, so yeah. And you wouldn't see it as the same. Yeah. Uh, you would just see it as something different. But, but I'm saying even, I'm not just saying this. Um, OK. What this requires is that you need to be able to, you walk into a room, you, you pop yourself down here, you look at A, and you, do, you need to be able to recognize where you are in A's location space. Uh, yeah. You need to, and that requires, um, this this whole this whole way of approach of approaching this is child objects and parent objects. Like the kind of the fundamental approach is like you learn the child objects really well, and then you're then then you're set. Then you're then you're really good at then you can handle parent objects. Well, um, I'm assuming that I walk in assuming I understand. I already know A, B, C, and D, even yeah. though each recognizing those is the same problem. So, but let's assume we did that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, so this, this is like about where you would construct these things. Okay, so I mean, I'm trying to put this into some neural tissue, right? That's the that's the challenge here. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I have a column, and um, that column's going to have um, uh, it's going to have some grid cells in it, and it's going to have some orientation cells in it. And um, and if I say, okay, well, that column is observing my position relative to A, and then my position relative to B then I'm using those cells. But I have to have this active at the same time, too. Right? Because yeah. this has to stay active because I'm building up this, this larger object. And I have to anchor it and continue to, and somehow I have to transfer this knowledge here to that, if I don't understand how that's done. So, you know, I'm wondering if this can all be done in one column or if it requires, you know, the other way of looking at it is you've got, you know, a what and a where column in some sense. Uh, 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 I, I just don't know if it can be all done in one column. Like, where does the neural machinery to do this um, uh, reside? Um, uh. I mean, yeah, at this point, all I can do is um, I can j basically s draw the cosine poster on, yeah. on this and say, like, yeah, 6A, 6B. Yeah, right. so this could be 6A and 6B. Uh, and then, like, something yeah. else doing it. The problem with that is, as I see it, is. The, the 6A projects to layer 4, right? And six, in order to actually predict what you're going to see, um, you must have already incorporated orientation. So here I have drawn both location and orientation. Well, well um, my point is um, I don't see, if I look at layer 4, let's say, and we got this 6A projecting to it. 
Um, I don't see 6A could be both of these things. It couldn't be grid cells and orientation cells. Uh, it, um, it's more like saying, you know, I, I've argued that if I, if I think about orientation as its own metric space, then the orientation, actual representation of orientation, would be unique to the object and the location uh, in the world. It's like just like grid cells are unique. Um, and so if I think about this as orientation, then that's the orient not just it's not just one orientation module, it's a whole bunch of orientation modules. And therefore it is uh, it's an it's a unique, it's unique to all the world. And therefore I can I can predict exactly what my input should be because I know my location and orientation. It's it's one set of cells that do this. There's only it's 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 uh, you know it's a it's a bunch of modules here. Let's say, and we can think of the orientation modules, but together they're unique. So unique to the current location space or to the current location. Uh, both. It's unique in the world. Um, uh, when you move, how does that change? It changes because. Um, uh, uh, it has to change because my what, what I predict at different orientations, uh, what I predict when I'm looking in different directions is going to change, right? Um, okay, I just thought that this would only update in response to. No, that's what commands. I'm saying. It's it's unique to location and orientation. It's uh, I don't understand how this works yet, but it has to be. I mean, it, it's it's like if I, if I think about it, it's like grid cell modules. You know, grid cells specifies a location relative to some object, but that location is unique to the entire world. Um, in this case, I'm spe specifying an orientation relative to the object, but it's also unique to the location, all locations in the world. So if I'm going to predict what I'm, my input's going to be, I have that prediction can only occur at a specific location, at a specific orientation in that specific location. It has to do both of those. So if I think of these orientation modules like that, it'll do that. It'll say, yes, given this state of cells here, I can predict exactly what, you should, what your input should be. This is why we never really predicted orientation. It didn't really work. Um, uh, it's, it's that you can't predict the, what your input is going to be just knowing your orientation relative to the object. You have to know where you are in the object in your orientation to it, and then you can predict it. Um, if, I, if I saw two sets of cells here, um, both projecting to layer four, and I say, oh, okay, one's orientation, one's location, maybe I could get away with that, although I don't like that because it's always hard for the, this layer cells to know what to look at. So this more copacetic example is not to do that. The more copacetic example is just to say, no, nope, I got one set of cells here, 6A, and if it's going to present, it's going to, if it's going to be predictive of what's going on in layer four, that this rep it needs to represent a specific location in the world that's also specific to the object because it's, you know, uh, and, as, and it's going to represent uh, the orientation at that particular uh, point in the world. And that would all come about from a bunch of small, uh, you know, even single dimension uh, orientation modules. You just, it, they just anchor differently, just like we think grid cells anchor differently. So it's completely con consistent with how grid cells work today. I mean, orientation cells, head direction cells work today. They look, they look like individual orientation cells, like, oh, yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm at this direction in this object. But if you look at a set of them, they would all be anchored differently, and they'd all be changing together, but they'd all be anchored differently, and so you would, you would have no way of seeing this um, unless you looked at the population and how, you know, the, the way to see well, if I'm tuning it, telling it's true, true, you have to look at a bunch of uh, grid, uh, head direction cells, and you say, oh, this one represents this way, and this one represents this way, and this one represents this way. In a different object, they have a different relationship to each other. Right, the, and another object. This one could be this way, and this this one could be that way, and this one could be this way. Um, uh, they all look like head direction cells in any environment. They're all consistently doing the right thing, but the set of them would be unique. Um, that's a really nice idea. It doesn't make it correct, but it's a really nice idea. It's like a, it's consistent with grid cells. It's the whole. It's just so anyway. That's where I'm coming from. I'm coming from. I've got this layer of cells here, which is this. It's sort of this point in the entire universe and an orientation, um, and it has to change, obviously, as I move. Um, it's, it's weird. It's almost like I'm, I'd be saying individual modules here wouldn't be changing because my orientation, if I'm here and I just move this way, my orient, and I'm still facing the same direction. We're almost just saying that like, these cells aren't even updating, but somehow they have to reflect it. It doesn't make sense to me. Um, anyway. so. Um, this is talking about what's your intuition about, I said we could try to do this in one column, we could also try to do it in two columns, uh, like, like a where column and a what column. 
And that comes naturally if I start thinking about uh, where something is relative to me as opposed to where I am relative to it. Have you thought about that at all? Does that, does that strike you as like, hey, it's a good idea or a bad idea, or you know, there's reasons I wouldn't want to think about it that way? Um, maybe you haven't thought about it at all. I, I don't have much to say about whether it should be one column or two column. Uh, the question of um, should you think of it as my location relative to, to the thing versus the thing's location relative to me um, is definitely an interesting topic because like, suppose that this is like uh, me relative to thing uh, and to thing, uh, and I'll, I guess I'll draw in green the, a, a version that, could, that looks like quite similar. Um, this is the thing relative to me. Yeah. Uh, they, they are not, rep the, the neural tissue, there, re there really is a difference. Th thing relative to me, um, rel to me. No, uh, yeah, yeah. Or, um, or, or me relative to the thing. Um, oh, no, you have me relative to the thing and thing yeah. relative to yeah, the yeah, other okay. Yeah, so like um, there is a one to one correspondence between these. Yeah. Like, um, however, if you look at these in isolation, if you look yeah. at just this in isolation versus just this in isolation, yeah. they, their properties are different. Uh, How so? Well, right now, like your location relative to this marker yeah. is changing like crazy. When, when I rotate when I yeah. rotate this marker, you're just like you're you're involved. You're making these big circles around it. Yeah, yeah, as yeah, I rotate. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so I would I would be those are, these cells would be changing a lot at that yeah. point in time. Where if it's relative to me, the, the this, location this part is staying still. This is this, this part is changing. Yeah, yeah. So so like the the way that the cells are representing all that is totally different. However, if you look at it conjunctively, all of this together, it does align yeah, one yeah, to yeah. one with something. That's interesting point because it does seem much more. It, it, it does feel like, it, it, I told you, it even just feels to me like when I observe, when I sit in the room here, and I've done this sitting in the room, and look around at the different objects, um, it, it feels to me is that I'm, I, I'm, I'm noticing where these things are relative to me and relative to me. I mean, it just feels like that. I, you know, it, I don't feel like these, I'm flipping around these yeah. objects, you know. <laughs> yeah. it, this does sound a lot like, though, it doesn't feel like the Earth's revolving I know, around I know, I know, I know. I know. <laughs> but, but, you know, it is, it is um, yeah. Uh, it's also, yeah, it's also something interesting. You know, these, these cells have to change based on a movement command, right? That's the whole idea. If they're grid cells, they have to change on the movement command. If I think about, um, if, I am, if I'm asking where something is relative to me, I have that movement command. The movement command is I'm turning my head. And, and, and that, um, that is easy. I turn my head and this thing changes. If I'm turning my head and if, if, if it's, re it's really easy here too. Yeah, it's, 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 it's just, the, just as easy there. Uh, but, but, but I'm, it's more like, well, I, I feel like path integration um, in general is easier in this world. Really? Than in this world. Mm. I don't know. Anyway, when I think of you know, we've we've written about the where cells, the where columns, as being objects relative to me, and um, but clearly that's happening. We've we've talked about it in terms of it's in the paper in the frameworks paper. I wrote about it in terms of movement, right? I ended up moving like, oh, I wanted my hand from one place in my body relative to my body to another place. Um, the reason I didn't write about it in terms of objects is because I didn't have an under I didn't have a good explanation for that. I wasn't I wasn't I had no explanation to say well what is the you know what's the equivalent of an object in in body space. Um, this explanation here is an example of an object in body space. It's it's um, it's like oh, relative to my body there's an object around me now. Um, anyway, I, I'm I'm just toying with this thing. I, I, I guess what, I, what I'm trying to get at here is I think understanding exactly how we do this problem and explain it clearly and simply in our model of the cortex um, is, going to be, is, a, is a great way of working on all these remaining issues, including orientation and so on. It, it strikes me as, um, um, I, I, I hear your explanation for it, but it's, and it doesn't even deal with the orientation part yet, so we don't really have a full solution. Um, but it feels to me that this, there is a simple solution to this. There's a simple way of saying how it is I, you know, using the neural tissue we see, how it is I, of all these issues we're talking about, how it is I just do this very rapidly. Um, and maybe you feel comfortable you've got it already. I just feel to me it's too No, I, I, have, so I have a partial solution. Okay, so. I think it goes back to being able to do these transforms effectively. Yeah. yeah. That's the missing piece. 
Well, what, what do you mean? The, the, what's, what's the missing piece? Which transforms affect me? The displacement transforms, or uh, you saying? Displacement is one example of a yeah. transform, but rotations too, and yeah. maybe scale as well. Well, you know, I didn't talk about the scale because I've been thinking a lot about that. One of the things, of course, is that when I observe C here, I have to know how far away it is. And of course, uh, and, and it so is. To me, that's just a displacement thing. Well, it's what, not do you mean? A, what do you mean? Just, just the physical distance from. Yeah, you but how do I know that? It's, it's a requirement to, to. That's an absolute requirement for, this, for me to do this to this. And so, what I've argued uh, recently. Um, is that you know you have this model of C and now it's further away you know you're well, will the, will the set of displacement cell modules give you that it'll be unique to that distance uh, well let me just finish my thought um, I don't think that I, I, I now got this idea that we encode distance uh, partially by these uh, oscillation frequency changes in the thalamic mm -hmm. cortical loop I, I think there's a lot to that idea. And so if I'm, if I'm observing this, this object from a distance, and I'm, and I'm say I'm moving my eyes over the object, left and right, and say I'm looking at it through a straw, right? And I see a little feature, I mean, another feature, another feature, a little feature, a little feature, a little feature. That's how I think about it. Um, the radial distance I change to, to see that object is small, it's last one, the object further away, and it's large when the object is closed. And and so, uh, you know, I, you know for, me, I, for me to think that I even have to do that requires that, um, that, that you, you're going you're gonna to take your movement command and, and scale it. Um, so the idea is I have, I have an expectation of how far I have to move to get from one side of this object to the other. And the further away it is, I have to scale down my movement so the same movement vector results in a smaller change. And that um, is going to, you know, I think that's going on between this, this thalamic um, uh, oscillation change to doing it. So my point is that even just observing this thing at, out here and knowing where it is, uh, I have to, I have an encoding. I believe I'm going to have to have an encoding of that distance, uh, moment to moment, as I look at different things. I'm going to have an encoding of that distance. And so it's, it's almost like saying I recognize the object at an orientation. And the distance is encoded in the is encoded in the, this frequency in the thalamic oscillation. So it's like saying, oh, you know, yes, it's a pen, and it's a disorientation. How far away it is? The only way I can really know that is to, is to read out this oscillation frequency change. Um, otherwise, I have to learn the objects at all different different scales, um, and I don't think we're going to do that. Um, so that's another part of the, the the solution I think we have to come up with is just somehow that. I have these orientations um, of things, and I'm encoding the distances using this, and, and that's going to be part of the neural. I'm working on the idea that that's going to be part of the, the neural mechanism. It's, and one way to think about it is, is then I it's somehow if I'm going to build up the structure of this this room, I have to as I place things, I have to somehow decode this or do something with it to, to know like oh yeah that's how far away it is. That's therefore I can build the, to, to know where to place it in the room. Um, I don't know. Anyway, as I said, I'm not working on this all the time, just as I'm writing so much, but um, I think this is the problem. I, I really feel this is like the core problem. This is a, so often it's the, you wanted to find this, the right problem to solve. And this feels to me like, this is, for me, the language that works to solve this problem. That this is, a, I, can def, I can put my finger on this problem and say, okay, how do I go from here to here and know this is going on? And then we have to be able to make everything work. You know, everything. Um, it's a simple problem to state. Um, it also, it also, by the way, it gives you an interesting pause. It's to say, what's a place cell? I've argued that place cells are are just a way of encoding. You could think of a place cell as just encoding this radial object around you. So, but but then I've also argued that place cells are what you want to. Um, Store in 6B, like I have the, the grid cells. If a grid cells were in 6B, I want to associate with some location in the in the in the in the room the place cells. But th there's a problem with that because um, uh, I don't know how do you describe this problem? Um, it's sort of like uh, as I move over here, I, I, if the place cells are purely determined by my sensory inputs. Um, 
I couldn't I couldn't know that in advance in order to populate the model of the, of the room. But, uh, I, I just I don't know. I don't know how to describe that. Anyway, I, I just I just want to I want to keep I'm going to keep bringing this up over and over again because I think we have to solve this problem. <laughs> um, and I think that's the key uh, the key to the the research that on the neuroscience that we have to do this year. This is this gets at the core of the, all these issues we've kind of been dancing around. Um, and, and maybe the thing I'm doing today is introducing the idea that we might have to have a where column and a, and, a, and a what column. That we might have to go there to solve this problem. Which we haven't really taken advantage of before. Um, all right, I have nothing else to talk about it other than just talk about the problem. Anything else, Matt? Well, it's something I want to talk to you about, but I don't know. Is that the research main thing or not? Probably not. Let's okay. just talk about timing with the sensory motor circuits. Okay. Well, let's do that offline now. Okay. And Marcus, I want to, can you, are we done here? Can we, are we going to stop? Uh, yeah. Can we just really quickly look at the